no cutesy jokes here. Let's just cut to the chase. Ellie isn't immune. Period. End of story. And today, I'm going to prove it to you because the implications of what this means for the entire franchise are huge. Internet, welcome to Game Theory, the show that was bit by an infected nerd back in 2009 and hasn't been showing any symptoms of nerd rage since. Honest. Oh, no! At least box stacking makes sense. Welcome to Sometimes you gotta know when to call educate. it. But today I'm not here to talk about my rage. I'm here to talk to you about a game that's either causing you to rage or making you think it's all the rage, depending on which perspective you're coming from. That's right, friends. Today I'm tackling The Last of Us Part 2. The game with a plus 10 out of 10 ratings from some, zero stars out of five from others, and a big fat debunked from yours truly. That's right. Today I'm not here to take sides on whether this is a good game or an awful game. I'm just here to tell you that there is something serious that we've all overlooked in the game. And it rocks the very foundation that this franchise was built on. More specifically, the main character of the game, Ellie, is not the linchpin in the story that we're told. In fact, there's nothing special about her. She most likely is not not immune to the zombifying fungus plaguing the Last of Us universe. And the craziest thing of all is I think that the developers might know this. You thought you were mad about the story decisions made by this game before? Just wait until you hear about the decisions that they've been hiding in plain sight the entire time. But let's back up. To fully understand what I'm talking about today, we need to rewind briefly to catch everyone up on The Last of Us Part 1 so we can immediately dismantle it right afterward. The Last of Us Part Uno takes place in a universe where the fungus cortex a real-world fungus that we've already talked about on the channel, mutates to use humans as hosts. If you aren't familiar with the fungus, it's the closest you'll ever get to a real-life version of the movie Alien. In the game, Cordyceps takes over a huge portion of the human population, and protagonist Joel loses his daughter in the initial outbreak, becoming a smuggler to survive in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. One day, he's asked to smuggle Ellie, a 14-year-old girl who was bit by an infected zombie, but who magically never turned into a monster. Suddenly, the whole hope for humanity Humanity rests on this one girl, as she needs to get across the country to a bunch of scientists so they can create a vaccine using her to solve the outbreak once and for all. Again, I just covered that topic in a recent theory and talked about the fact that it's not only a bad idea, but a complete scientific whoopsie-daisy since you create vaccines to combat viruses and not fungal infections, but you know what? For today's theory, we're just gonna roll with it. Anyway, since there's a Last of Us Part 2, you can imagine that things don't quite go as planned at the end of that first game. Turns out the scientists are gonna kill Ellie to get her blood for this impossible vaccine, and she's a protagonist, so that's not gonna fly. Making a vaccine would have killed you, so I stopped. Joel decides to save Ellie's life from the stupid dumb dumb vaccine doctors, which, you know, doesn't make Ellie too happy in the sequel when she finds out. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have mattered, but you took that from me. From there, The Last of Us Part 2 is basically Ellie's revenge drama, which I don't really have to spoil in order for you to understand this theory. Suffice it to say, the game devolves into a violent killing spree because, I mean, this is a video game, so unless you're flexing your interior decorating muscle on your own private island, you're going on a killing spree. Also, it's worth noting that pretty much everything we see Ellie do throughout The Last of Us Part 2 would be scientifically impossible based on the information that the game is explicitly giving to us, but we're about to get to that right now, so no more pussyfooting around. It's time to get into the nitty gritty. Let's talk about Ellie's so-called immunity. She's the only person with it, and both games hinge on the idea that she has some special medical magic going on inside of her that can help save the rest of the world. After you took me out of the Firefly Hospital, you said there were dozens of people like me. I've never met another immune person. Before. But you see, even though that's all we understand about it, that's not all the game tells us about it. The Last of Us Part 1 actually has a single recording from a surgeon that gives us a much greater understanding of Ellie's condition. The girl's infection is like nothing I've ever seen. The cause of her immunity is uncertain. As we've seen in all past cases, the antigenic titers... The patient's cordyceps remain high in both the serum and the cerebrospinal fluid. Blood cultures taken from the patient rapidly grow cordyceps and fungal media in the lab. However, white blood cell lines, including percentages and absolute counts, are completely normal. There is no elevation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
At an MRI of the brain shows no evidence of fungal growth in the limbic regions, which would normally accompany the prodrome of aggression in infected patients. Ah, yes. Some high-quality medical gobbledygook, my friends. Very insightful. Very intriguing. I'm sure that if you're like 99.9% .9 of the gaming population without an advanced medical degree, you heard the word titers, giggled that it looked like titters, then looked for the skip conversation button to get on with the zombie killing. Turns out, though, there's a lot of information hidden inside that little paragraph. Enough to tell us that Ellie isn't having a normal reaction to the fungal infection, and also that something's not right about the way the science is being scienced. Let's break down what this audio log is actually telling us. We know that cordyceps is the fungus that infects people, so we already know one word, we're on our way. An antigenic titer is just a test to see if the thing that's infecting you is really infecting you. So in the first sentence here, he's basically saying, we tested for cordyceps, yep, it's there. This line here about serums and fluids tells us that it's in her brain and in her spine. If you keep going, it basically translates to, should be turning her into a zombie, but oh look, it's not. This one's important here. Her white blood cells, the ones that usually go crazy when they find an infection in your body, aren't doing anything. The rest of the recording basically says that everything that should be swollen, elevated, angry, and zombie-like in her body just isn't, even though she's technically infected. In short, her immune system isn't reacting to this infection at all. They go on to say that this is like the biggest medical breakthrough ever, yada yada yada. Turns out that these guys did not exactly graduate at the top of their medical school class. Or, at the very least, they flunked out of their course on immunology. Immunology is kind of exactly what it sounds like. The study of how and why people are immune to things and how your immune system works. Under normal circumstances, your immune system regulates itself. Your body discovers something that shouldn't be in there, and everybody rallies together in your bloodstream to kick it out. Get off my lawn! And by lawn, I mean out of my body. This involves an inflammatory response, including your white blood cells getting produced in overdrive to eat up the invading bacteria, virus, fungi, or whatever. Sometimes there's lots of other inflammatory reactions, like your body giving you a fever, swelling, turning red around the infection. All of that is your immune system doing its best to fight off something that shouldn't be in your body. In the Last of Us universe, the cordyceps fungus attacks your body, and your body has a big inflammatory response while you turn into a zombie. So what is different about Ellie? As we just listened to in that audio log, her immune system system isn't reacting. So is that the reason she has this magical medical protection against the fungus? No, but we don't know that until The Last of Us Part 2. You see, again, just like in the first game, we get the briefest of glimpses as to the detailed inner workings of how Ellie's condition functions. Here, we get ourselves a look at Ellie's medical records, and immediately we start to see something that doesn't quite add up. Again, we're presented with what looks like scientific junkity junk, but what it really is is a pretty intelligent eligible CBC blood panel that we've seen in every major medical drama ever. Most of us have had one of these charts made for ourselves when we get our blood work done, and it shows the various levels of stuff in your blood system. You'll notice several things on this chart labeled with an L. That means that their levels are low relative to normal. In Ellie's blood work, we see that her WBC, her white blood cells, her RBC, red blood cells, her HCT, or hematocritical cells, and her hemoglobin, or HGB, are all low. Bit of a head scratcher for a girl who's supposed to be infected with a fungus that's causing an inflammatory reaction. In fact, she's supposedly infected with this fungus, but she's experiencing the reverse of what you would expect. What we would call immunosuppression. And uh, by the way, it's worth pointing out that these numbers in themselves are a bit outlandish, even for a video game. If these were real life numbers, Ellie would be almost non-functional with a red blood cell count this low. You can see on this chart that the lowest red blood cell levels should be about 4.0 microliters. Ellie is half of that, meaning that she is suffering from some serious anemia. In reality, she would be freezing cold, incredibly weak, her hands would be numb, her lips would be blue. Also, notice that her white blood cell count, the cells fighting off infections, are also half of their normal range, meaning that the deadliest thing to Ellie in this game isn't Abby or zombies or anyone coming after her, it's catching a cold. So anyway, we're taking it on faith that she's still standing right now, but back to the zombies. Because here's the big reveal, friend, the truth of all of Ellie's medical information points us to one conclusion. She does have cordyceps, she just has the wrong type of cordyceps. You see, cordyceps, the magical zombie fungus, isn't a single fungus at all. Not even close. Cordyceps is actually a family of fungi that contain about 400 different species, some of which turn animals into zombies, some of which, believe it or not, cause the exact symptoms that we see present in Ellie. The Last of Us developers most likely modeled the in-game fungus 
on the species Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which is the real fungus that actually turns ants into zombies, like you see what happens with people in the game, right down to the fungus sprouting straight out of the head. But Cordyceps brings a lot more to the party. Meet a different species, Tolipocladium inflatum, which sounds like a fungus-shaped pool float or a forgotten Harry Potter spell. This separate brand of Cordyceps is used to create the medicine Cyclosporin, the world's most commonly used immunosuppressive drug. Or in normal people terms, a drug that gives you all the results that we see in Ellie's medical chart. Lowers your white blood cell count, prevents all your inflammation, in short, wipes out your immune system. And all from a Cordyceps fungus. Normally, this fungus can't interact with a human host, but remember, in the Last of Us universe, it's well established that these fungi have mutated so they can infect humans. If the zombie strain of Cordyceps can do it, why not any strain of Cordyceps, including the one that wipes out your immune system? The fact is that this is a more reasonable explanation for why Ellie isn't responding to the zombie fungus like everyone else, yet still reads positive for Cordyceps. She's not magic, she's just not infected with the same strain. And you see, this explains everything. Remember, in that first recording, the surgeon says that she tests positive for cordyceps. The antigenic titers of the patient's cordyceps remain high in both the serum and the cerebrospinal fluid. Well, if she was indeed infected with this other branch of the fungus, this would be true. She is testing positive, just not for the zombie species of cordyceps, a different one. To get that sort of false positive, the antigen test that the surgeon is giving her just isn't specific enough to tell the difference between the two closely related fungal strains. Not that hard to believe. And there's more. Not only does this explanation address her weird medical chart, it also explains why she continues walking around in the game without ever getting infected. Remember that bite and the fact that she doesn't wear a mask when walking around to protect her from fungal spores? We know all too well these days the importance of wearing a mask, so why isn't Ellie just picking up the deadly strain of cordyceps along with the one that she already has? Even if Ellie isn't initially infected with the right species of fungus, you would think that at some point she would pick it up since she's walking around inhaling spores left and right. Right? right? No, actually, not at all. It turns out that even if Ellie were infected with the bad version of the fungus, from the first bite, from the spores, whatever, it couldn't have turned her into a zombie because cyclosporin is also an antifungal medicine. That's right, the good version of cordyceps that I'm theorizing that she has not only suppresses her immune system like we're seeing in her blood work, but also wards off other fungi. Doesn't even feel badly about it either. Cyclosporin A produced directly by the Tolipocladium inflatum is used to treat even severe fungal infections, including serious ones in the eyes, which we know from the game is the first area that the zombie cordyceps attack. So having one version of cordyceps is actually keeping Ellie from getting any other version. This also, also explains how Ellie can continue to walk around in game without a mask. She's not immune to cordyceps in the sense that she can't get infected. She's immune in the sense that she's already infected with another closely related fungus from the same family that kills off any of its brothers and sisters. Again, those white blood cell counts of hers aren't looking too good, so she should probably avoid, like, pretty much everything else, but otherwise, she's a walking anti-fungal machine. So the one thing, and only thing, that she doesn't have to worry about in this world is becoming a zombie. So there you have it, friends. The key to stopping the Cordyceps zombie apocalypse in the Last of Us universe was more Cordyceps. It wasn't about becoming immune to the Cordyceps fungus, it was just about being infected by the other correct strain of it. The upshot here is, in a global zombie pandemic, study up on your fungi and don't assume anything about who's immune and who isn't. Just like, wear a mask and keep a safe distance from anyone who could have been exposed. Is there like a lesson to be learned about the current state of the world from this theory? Nah, can't be it. I mean, walking around wearing a mask? That's just, that's just a theory, right? No, that's a fact. But as for Ellie and her immunity, that was a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Or who knows, maybe you're just listening. I've been saying thanks for watching since the very first episodes of this channel, but more and more people are just listening to YouTube than watching it. No, that's actually how I do the bulk of my YouTubing these days. And if you want to listen to your favorite YouTube channels with premium earbuds at a not-so-premium price, I recommend to you Raycon's Everyday E25s, our sponsor for today's episode. Let's just talk about what they do right, shall we? One, most importantly, they fit in your darn ears. They stay comfortable in your ear, and they're discreet. I 
use my earbuds most when I'm working out. Yes, I do work out. Gotta fight off that Corin 10 extra pounds somehow. And we all know that working out just already sucks. So it is the most infuriating thing when I'm doing the sucky activity of exercising, and then I'm also having to constantly readjust earbuds that are slipping out of my ears. With Raycon's Everyday E25s, it's not a problem. They have a great shape and a variety of different heads, uh, tips, whatever these little rubbery things are. It comes packaged with a lot of those to ensure that I have the right fit for my ears. It's great. Number two, charge. Second most obnoxious thing about wireless earbuds is when I want to use them and they're not charged. Again, not a problem with everyday E25s. With six hours of total playtime per charge and a slim case that charges the earbuds every time I store them in there. Charging the case once actually gets me at least like four days of the buds being charged because one charge of the case gets you four charges of the buds. It's, it's great. Anyway, long story short, ever since switching to the Raycon Everyday E25s, I have not had to worry about charging them once. Finally, number three, price. Earbuds are just like stupidly expensive. Like, come on, $250 for the cheapest model of some of these things? That's just dumb. And let's be honest, you don't need it. Raycon delivers incredible quality of sound, incredible ease of use, fun colors, and all of it for less than half the cost of other premium earbuds. In fact, if you go to buyraycon.com slash matpat, M-A-T-P-A-T, not only are you already getting yourself that low price, but you'll get an additional 15% off your order because I talked to the people over there and they gave me a special deal. Use my code because it tells them that I'm providing value to them and that I'm a good partner and that they should continue partnering with me, which, you know what, they should because I love their darn earbuds. Anyway, TLDR, if you need premium earbuds, because let's face it, with all of us spending more time indoors, being quiet for a roommates or loved ones or in my case sleeping toddlers raycon's everyday e25s are my preferred pick link is in the top line of the description order there to save yourself 15 percent thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you next week for a portal theory